everyone and welcome to the latest edition of This Racing Life. Later in the show, I'll be catching up with dual purpose trainer Paul Weber, who looks to have a star mare on his hands in the shape of Indefatigable. However, first I'm catching up with another dual purpose trainer. He made his breakthrough at Group 1 level this past summer, and that man is Alan King. Alan, over a million pounds in prize money for the flat season, over half of which was down to your wonderful, wonderful gelding, Trushan. What were expectations coming into this season? Yeah, we were obviously very hopeful that he would be able to certainly acquit himself very well in those races. You know, he was very progressive um, the year before. Uh, looked very good at Ascot um, on Champions Day. So yeah, we, we had big hopes for the season, but um, they probably exceeded our expectations. Not many horses would be able to lump a huge weight in the Northumberland plate and then rack off a, a Group 1 treble. Take me back to Goodwood, for example. The ground is obviously very important to him, but you must have been going there very confident. I firmly believe if we hadn't gone to Newcastle, I'm not sure he won the Goodwood Cup. You know, he needed, to, he needed to get away from home and have a gallop, and, and it brought him more nicely. So, And then Goodwood, of course, we were very hopeful. And then when um, the Gorsons withdrew Stradivarius, Shortly before, I got extremely nervous when we were suddenly odds on for a Goodwood Cup. But um, and he did he did actually quite a lot wrong in the race. He was very fresh, uh, a little bit keen and lit up, but um, he powered away at the end, and uh, it was a huge relief. And 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 I was delighted as well. But I think relief was the thing. You've been in positions where there's great pressure, Cheltenham Festival horses. Yeah, but I would still get extremely nervous when we've got a fancy run on one of those. You know, I was. Um, I was pretty nervous for Sue Royal last week at Wincanton as well. So when you've got, when you've got running your good horses and, and, you, and you've got a great chance, then the, the nerves kick in. And I don't suppose we'd do it without that. It's a hell of a horse to be able to do the things that we've said, not least to take a quick backup of winning a Group 1 in France and then another on Champions Day. Yeah, I mean, we, that was, we just got away with that. Um, but I, I just felt it was his last run of the season. Um, if it didn't work, we had all all uh, winter to get over it. But, but Dan Horsford, my assistant, who rides him every day, I mean, he was very happy with him on the run-up to, to Ascot. He was a little bit more on edge than normal. He was quite a handful to saddle, and I think we were just bordering on the line and being over the top. Um, and I don't think he, he ran into his best on the day, but it was it was good enough, you know. Talk to me about Asymmetric. Wonderful season for him, Group 2 winner. What were you expecting when he first arrived at the yard? What kind of vibes was he giving you? Well, Martin Harley was strongly involved with the horse right the way through, and he actually rode him in his breeze, and, and Martin was adamant this was a, a proper horse. So um, we were able to get him at the breeze ups, and um, you know, the rest history. He won his first two, narrowly beaten in the July stakes, and, and then came forward again um, at Goodwood. Um, run another, well, his last two runs were very solid, possibly just over the top in the middle park, but he, did, he had a busy time, you know, he'd been prepared for a breeze ups, and... We hadn't really missed him through the summer, um, so he's away having a, a good break in one of the studs in New Market at the moment, and looking forward to next year. Those kind of races that he's been running in, sometimes you're looking at a guinea horse, possibly not him though. I wouldn't have thought so, you know, I mean, he might get seven, I couldn't imagine him getting any farther, I mean, I think he's a sort of six furlong horse. I'm no expert on sprinters, but I think, <laughs> I think that's what he's telling me. Later in the show, we'll be up on the gallops, seeing how So Royal et al. are put through their paces. And another exciting hurdler who's already made her mark this season is Indefatigable. Grade 2 winner up at Weatherby. She's trained by Paul Weber, who I pick up the story with. She was bred by a great friend of mine, John O'Connor of Bally Kelly, started in Ireland. And John and I became friends because he decided it wasn't worth being enemies in the bloodstock world. We were always bidding on the same horses. And if you meet John, he has a certain awe about him that makes you think you want to be a friend rather than an enemy. <laughs> and um, he had this filly, bred this filly um, out of a very tough mare who um, had been placed at one great stakes in America, I think. And um, she was third at Punchestan, and he rang me up and said, um, I've got a good filly, I'd like to stay in for a leg or two. Have you got, you know, have you got a victim? I've had horses with Paul for a while, and he is great friends with John O'Connor, who's the breeder in Ireland, and he told me that um, there was this mare where I come third in a bumper in Ireland, would I be interested? And I watched the race, and I met John, and yeah, I was interested. And we shared, we, he was my partner for a while, he still really is my partner, but I, 
I brought him out a little while ago. It was Friday the 13th, and that's never been a worry to us. 13's been a lucky number in the Weber family for years. I used to buy a few horses for Martin, and um, so I've known him, and we've always chatted away. And then to meet him just as we were going to go and saddle the horse, I thought, well, hang on, this, something's going to happen here. Uh, we'd been second in the bumper twice uh, to Soto and Press Gang. We won the Imperial Cup with uh, Lady Bamford's College of Briganti, and then he got beat by Barna Boy a couple of lengths in the uh, Coral, uh, sorry, in the, um, yeah, in the um, County Hurdle. So we just missed the bonus with him. So we've had quite a few near misses there. But it, it was literally how all those stars aligned from the beginning of the indefatigable story to, to that very day. Um, sort of thing that racing seems to throw up sometimes. Well, it was just before lockdown was about to start and I was all literally dressed and ready to go. And then we were umming and ahhing about whether we should or shouldn't go and we decided not to, so we all watched it at home. But as it happens, my nephew, Robert, was um, on a stag do at Cheltenham and so he was the family representative. Yeah, I'll see lots of runners in, in Martin Pipe every year and it's usually a bit of carnage down at the start. Um, there was a full start um, in the fatical. She, she wouldn't be massively keen on big fields. The only thing she wanted to do at the start was either bite or kick anything in sight. And so when they had a second start, she had to be behind them all. She really didn't want to get going. And she was right at the back for a long time. I hadn't planned to sort of be that far back, but she was a bit laboured at the start. And um, I thought I'd just have to sit and suffer here until, um, until things open up at the top of the hill. And my younger daughter Alice kept saying, oh, Dad, don't worry, it's just not her day. I kept saying, well, you never know, you never know. And then coming round from the sort of third to last, coming round the bend, you could see her moving up and then towards the end. God, it was exciting. I knew I was coming home probably the fastest. Um, I thought there'd be, you know, you'd have to be on something seriously quick to be going faster than me at, at, up that hill at the time. Um, but it, we crossed the line together with uh, Pillion and um, yeah, to be f in fairness, when I was watching the slow motion on the big screen, I did, I did think uh, Pillion had won. So they went past, as you know, pretty close, and I had a feeling that she was finishing so quick that she m might have got there. And my wife Koo said, "Has she won?" I said, well, I said, "I don't want to say it, but um, I, I don't want to say anything." But I, th I was thinking that she might have done. First, number two, um, And, of course, then it's just shouts and screams and start crying now. <laughs> I was absolutely convinced. The rest of the family weren't. They were all saying, oh, no, she didn't quite make it. But I'm sure that wasn't logic, it was just emotion. But, yeah, then when, when they announced it was her and I saw Rex stick his hand up in the air, oh, God, it was so exciting, so exciting. I remember walking back down the chute. It was um, an incredible experience. It, it was a fantastic day and just to, just to get a winner there is so hard. I probably took it for granted at the time, but it's, it's, it's an incredible place, but it's extremely, you know, it's extremely hard to get winners. And um, I was lucky that she was on song that day. And um, yeah, I remember, you know, powering home thinking I'm, I'm close, I'm, I'm close, but I wasn't sure whether I got there or not. And um, yeah, it was... Uh, it was an amazing feeling when they when they called the number out. In some ways, it's very unfair because there's lots of people who've who've spent their lives owning horses and wanting to get there and never have. And I rock up and I get lucky quite quickly. But yeah, so I I don't I don't take it for granted at all. It's a huge privilege, and I'm a very very lucky chap to have come across a horse like Mary. This season, she's just been on fire. We we decided to give her the run at Pontefract to warm her up and get her going, and that. It worked. She, she was off the bridle for about two furlongs out and she was five or six lengths behind the two leaders who were fighting each other. But she just kept going because that's what she does. And she actually went uncomfortable in the end. She was 30 kilos heavier that day at Pontefract than she was when she was second at Sandown in April. And uh, she was still 17 kilos heavier than that weight when she won at, um, at Weatherby. So she, for some reason, she's eight now, rising nine, for some reason, she has filled out and developed. And through the summer, we, we were looking at her in the field, thinking, I still can't understand this. This mare's looking stronger and stronger. And it's just a case of that. She Usually, horses' weights don't change a great deal between season to season. But she's obviously thrived.
Well, my mum, my late mum, took me to Weatherby Races um, when I was a little boy. I don't remember when, I don't remember much about it, but it was a great experience and we just loved it. I took it on from there, really. So it felt, it felt very, very special. And my wife and I went up and uh, just, it was just unbelievable, unbelievable feeling. I got very, very excited as she was coming up the home stretch. And Paul says that it was wonderful to see me so excited. My wife says it was mildly embarrassing and she was terribly worried about what I was going to be saying. But it was, it was great fun, great fun. The crowd, everyone was so friendly and people were talking to us before as we were going, you know, following her out of the parade ring and then afterwards people coming up and saying, well done. People had no idea who they were. It was just lovely, just lovely. She's never travelled as well in a race as she did the other day. I think obviously stepping up to three miles has helped. Um, and her season last season was a little bit tricky. She, she doesn't want very heavy ground. And uh, it was very soft at Kempton when she disappointed one day. And we probably forced her too much in the race. Since then, she's hardly ever let us down on, on any occasion. And even if she hasn't won, she's always done her best. This lovely dry weather suits her very well. And um, I guess they'll start watering soon, but uh, <laughs> it should be reasonable ground for her. Then I imagine um, God will even up the weather and we'll probably have a soaking wet December or whatever. And so she may have to miss out and not go the long walk. Uh, I'd imagine that would be too soft to ask it. In which case, we could give her a run on the all-weather and um, I'd love to get a handicap mark on the flat. She needs one more run to get that mark because um, the Ascot Stakes might suit very nicely in June, nice summer ground, and it would be... Well, the absolute thrill would be to, have, you know, to win at the Cheltenham Festival and Royal Ascot with the same horse in the same year. So that's what keeps us thinking. I wouldn't want her to go and come sort of tailed off last. I mean, if she's got a reasonable chance and it's not... Because she's a very proud animal in her own way. You don't want to put her somewhere it's not going to work. Um, but if, if it does work and it makes sense, we'll, we'll be there. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. I think her competitive spirit is, is always there in the mornings, cantering up the hill, walking or trotting around the farm. Anyone gets too close, they'll get a snarl. Um, she won't kick out of them, but she'll tell them, look, I'm here, this is my area, this is my space. I, I think that, and I would imagine that her heart only just fits inside a rib cage. I imagine she's got a giant heart. And uh, combine that with, with her attitude, and let's hope, let's hope we have soundness on our side as well, and that's crucial. Um, but those three, those, those three attributes are, are her best. I think it means tireless, but I, it with, and she is, she's got all the stamina in the world, but with me it more sums up her spirit. She just is not going to be headed if she can possibly help it. Obviously sometimes she can't do anything about it, but she's just, it's all in, all in the mind. She's just determined that she's going to be the one and she will always try for you. Paul, you've been training since 1995. Just take me through the turn of events which saw you take out a licence for the first time. Well, uh, Dad was training here and trained about 300 winners. Um, Cheltenham winners with Elfast and Massey Ferguson with the Snipe and some lovely horses like Townley Stone, who was a homebred, homebred here. And uh, he wasn't very well at the beginning of 95. I was working in Newmarket for the Curra Bloodstock Agency, having had 12 years with them and had a fantastic time having been an assistant trainer before that with Jeremy Hindley and um, our gang of assistant trainers in those days were Messrs Haggis, Jarvis, Hammond, John Hills, Alex Scott, James Eustace, um, a wonderful, wonderful gang and so we probably had the most marvellous times in the early 80s in Newmarket as assistants and then Johnny Harrington who's a mentor in lots of things I've done, him and Jesse Dad used to buy horses from him, and that's how we met them. Uh, then he got me an interview with Sir Michael Stout, or even Michael then. And um, I was so excited about that, and I went for the interview, and got the job, got as far as the door. And when Sir Michael said he thought he ought to just check that there wasn't a lad that was working in the summer that wouldn't want to come for full time, and I went, Who's that? And he said, James Fanshawe. <laughs> and sure enough, Fanshawe seeing me trying to get up his inner, he slammed the door and John Ferguson and James Fanshawe became his assistants and not Paul Webber, which was uh, a 
biggest regret, I'd say. Uh, but I was then lucky enough to work for Jeremy Hindley for two and a half years, who was a marvellous boss, wonderful staff, and uh, had a great time with him and travelled horses to Chicago a couple of times and uh, Norway. And then, as I said, then Dad was getting, you know, not so well, and so I handed him my notice at the CBA to come back and start up at the end of the year, end of 95 with him, but he sadly died in May, so I was sort of commuting a bit between the two jobs. And then off we went. What kind of culture shock was that, coming back and suddenly being master of the house? Well, I, I think that I was very lucky in that there was already a you know, great staff here who'd been here quite a while and some established owners, uh, obviously very National Hunt owners. And um, at that stage, it, it, it was a shock, but it was, it was an easy transition to just try and bring in a few flat horses and uh, more dual-purpose horses and things like that. And obviously, you know, I'd been... You know, I was champion amateur in 80 and I'd ridden in America and ridden in New Zealand and that. So I had a lot of contacts at that stage. And uh, I think that obviously helped. And I think obviously having ridden too probably makes you a more understanding trainer of when things go wrong on the racetrack. You're starting up, you're terribly tentative to make sure you don't damage the horses. You, you want to win the races, obviously. But I think you start slightly tentative and you just need to build your own confidence as to how much work the horse is going to take. And I think sometimes, often find that the, the best trainers are the trainers that can, can work the horses hardest, probably. Partly because they know they don't want to break those horses, but they know there's another one coming along and they can go and buy another horse or whatever. I think in a small yard, which, which you know, we've become, you can, can get too tentative and say, well, I must look after this, must look after this. And then sometimes maybe, you know, you, you've got to say, hang on, I've got to get them fit, even though... We've only got a small number. Facilities-wise, you, you pack a fair punch. You've got a litany of, of great kit to work with. Just take me through a few of the things that you, you can offer here. Well, we're very lucky to be training on our own. Um, don't have to go on the roads at all at any stage. Um, we say that we can make our mistakes in private here rather than <laughs> it being public knowledge in Newmarket or Lambourne. Um, we've got a lovely six and a half furlong all-weather gallop. In the summertime, we have a rotivated canter of half a mile. We've got a four furlong grass gallop up the hill. We've got um, the jumping lane, the loose jumping lane, which is a wonderful place to get the horses, um, to teach the horses. We have a water walk, which is 150 metres of knee-deep water in the wintertime to cool the tendons and cool the shins and cool the joints. The swimming pool is a big investment, but it's one of those things you that tend to realise, oh, how do we ever live life without one? Uh, you can't get a horse fit in a swimming pool, but you can maintain a fitness. And if it has a shin problem or a bruised foot or a, those sorts of things, you can, you can keep ticking over rather than losing time. And it seems now that, you know, with training nowadays, you're always up against a bit of a deadline. And um, therefore, that helps you, you know, to keep the horses up to, up to that mark. Certainly, we've... Um, Got, got all the kit that we need. We just need to fill the, fill the boxes with better and better horses. Cheltenham is a special place for Weber then, and at the same festival, we saw Simply the Bet, who truly was simply the best. Earlier in the year, Tom Stanley spoke to Laura Collett about her involvement in the victory. I've worked with Harry um, for a few years now, and, and he kind of talked about the idea of sending them on the way to Cheltenham, and I thought, God, that's quite a lot of pressure. Um, but yeah, and then, then I think he had a bit of a freak out and changed his mind and then changed his mind again. And obviously there's a lot of pressure, pressure on the trainers and trying to, trying to get it right. And, you know, I think it all, it all ended up working out very well. Um, I mean, but yeah. I mean, the results say it definitely. So that was um, simply the bets in St. Calvados. Yeah. You were a first and a second. But you know the, the Cheltenham bars and everything, you know, in the national hunt world, it is all geared up towards Cheltenham. So there's definitely risk involved in that on, on school in the morning of, of their races. Yeah. But, what, but what can that, what, what in your mind, what does that do to the horse? Um, well, interestingly, the, those two horses, they would have come for two completely different reasons. Um, simply the bets, he, he thrived off coming. It really sweetened him up and it, it made him you know, he loved coming here and winging around the school and it just gave, you know, it just sort of almost switched him on. Um, and Calvados was, yeah, um, you know, he'd, 
he'd run some really good races and just missed out a few times. Um, and Harry felt like his his jumping technique had had let him down a bit when he was in close. He'd you know he'd hit the fence and not be that that slick over them. Um, so for him, it was about sharpening his technique up and and just getting him really focused on on jumping. You know better to make that bit of difference. Um, but yeah, I think it was it was a lot of pressure and the um, head lad that bought them basically gave me a leg up and just said, don't mess it up, uh, which That's was nice. really helpful. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it was an amazing day for me. Um, it was, I, I love doing it and I love feeling like I can help the horses out and make a difference. And um, like Andrew Brooks, the owner, invited me to to Cheltenham, um, I wasn't going to go. I, I love going to the festival, and I'd been on the Monday and Tuesday, um, and thought I should maybe stay at home and um, ride some horses. So Tuesday and Wednesday, not Monday, Tuesday, um, ride some of my own horses, and then I, I schooled them here, and they just felt amazing. And I thought I'll never forgive myself mm. if I don't go and see what happens. So um, it was really special to be a part of it, and um, yeah, like you said, the buzz at Cheltenham is like no other. If, if you have a trainer that says that this, I really need this horse to, to, to jump, this horse, his strength is not jumping. Do you feel that you can, you know, you can get, you can improve any horse's jumping just with enough time with them? I would say 95% of them. Um, I think over the years that we've done it, I think I've only had one horse that I sent back and said, I cannot do anything with this. Change of career. <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, but yeah, the majority you can you can improve. You know, obviously, some you can improve a lot more than others. But um, it's just something it's something different. And you know, it's for, for me the it's easier to sort of teach them from scratch. Um, you know, having worked with some of Harry's the you know the bumper horses that have never jumped before, teaching them to jump mm. from the beginning is a lot easier than you know something for example like St Calvados who's jumped in the same way for several years and then you're trying to change you've got a lot of bad habits to change but um even if you can only make a a small bit of difference it can be the you know it can be the difference between winning and, and finishing second so that was really interesting when william haggis did that interview on on racing tv and he, he you know, paid tribute to you and the work you've done with dubai honor and i remember being like what <laughs> dubai honor's been with laura collett because i think it, I, you know really naively i think of you helping out with horses that jump yeah but with with him, it's different. So, well, I don't know. Maybe you did get into things. I don't know. But it, no, but you, you know, do not. <laughs> but so that was a case. Of, I think he put it as that he needed freshening up. So, what 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 does that involve for you? Yeah, I think um, if that horse in particular had slightly lost his way, um, and I think William just wanted him to have a change of scenery and and just see if we could get his mind back on the job really. And I think um, it's. It's very easy for me working one on one with a horse. Obviously, you know William's got two hundred and however many horses, and you know they get ridden out in a string, and they've sort of got to you know do what everyone else does. Whereas you know here, you can take him away and 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 just try and figure his head out a little bit. And um, he, it's for me after the first couple of days, I I rang and said I think he's a bit of a spoilt brat, and he he just I think he'd probably just got away with things and and learnt to be a bit naughty and and take the mickey really um so it was taking him out of that situation where he could get away with with being naughty and um you know try and focus his brain on on something other than misbehaving and um you know it was very for, for, for me it was very basic but um you know it's easy and i said this to to william it's very easy for me because you can figure a horse out because it's me working them and me riding them and um, you can get inside their heads a lot easier than you know when they're in a string and you've got 30, 40 horses and different riders each day. So you're still keeping him fit, yeah. But, so, but just well, he, changing things up. Yeah, he came. Um, obviously, he, he came off sort of off the back of his his holidays. Um, it was in the winter time, and um, it was, I guess you'd call it pre-training. You know, he it wasn't. You know, he he didn't go up the gallops. He he hacked out. He trotted up the hills and and did work in the school. Um, it was more strengthening his body up um, and just getting him, getting his mind back on, on track and just sort of getting him to conform really and just do what, what you asked him to do. And, and um, yeah, he, he did turn a corner. 
um, and he was, you know, he was always a lovely horse, but he was he was cheeky, and he was he'd be the most challenging one of the racehorses that I've had probably. Now we return to Barbary Castle and Alan King's hopes for the jump season, including a Grade Two winner already this term, So Royal. Well, he was only a three-year-old when he arrived, and um, yeah, we always obviously we always liked him. Um, Went to Chepstow in his debut, won by a neck or something. We lost in the stewards' room, um, but he bounded on and won at Warwick afterwards. And yeah, he was always a decent horse, but I suppose we've all been very surprised just to the, the level he's got to. While he lost that one at Chepstow, there have been 16 other wins from his 40 starts. He's a horse of many trainers' lifetimes, and he's that rare commodity these days. Hurdles, fences, it doesn't matter. Exactly, and someone just said they were very surprised how quick he is over a hurdle considering he's jumped fences for most of his life as well and he's he is very adaptive I mean uh, it was sort of reported the other day that he was a better chaser than a hurdler and I was a bit surprised I thought there wasn't much between it and actually when he won the elite the other at Wing Canton the racing post he did his highest hurdling performance yet so for a nine-year-old still to be improving it's it's quite remarkable and a nine-year-old who has plenty of options going forward what's the plan his main mid-season target would be the Christmas hurdle um, and that would be followed by a, a holiday in January um, and possibly, I thought we'd, you know, I've got to speak to Bromley and Simon Lazet, possibly back to the game spirit. But we'll see. We'll, we'll go one race at a time. So it's a lovely problem to have with him. Do you think he could be even get, getting better? I'm sure he has. I mean, his homework this year has been better than I've seen. You know, in the past, he was always a, a decent workhorse, but I had to be very careful what I worked him with. Um, whereas he's working away with anything and you know the racing post have put him at his highest career highest total mark after the elite so yeah I think he is still improving I don't know why but I think he is what's he like to deal with <laughs> as a horse uh, out in the gallops at the race he's an absolute saint he's a little bit of a lad in the stable both ends he will come at you with the teeth and the back feet but um, we allow him to do that how important is it to have a horse like him, especially for big prominent owners in the yard, Isaac Swade and Simon Muneer? Oh, it's terrific. And, I mean, we all, all yards, look at how many horses you've got. You, you want a flagship horse, and he certainly has been that for the last few years. And, um, no, he's very special. Um, everybody's very fond of him. And he's just, uh, you know, he doesn't let you down. From one end of the scale, a nine rising ten-year-old, to a four-year-old, Nina the Terrier, who has been a bit of a revelation in recent starts. Three from three over hurdles, including taking a sizable scalp at Newbury last time. Yeah, I mean, she, she, we, we won on her hurdling debut at Warwick in the spring and we put her away. Um, she'd been working very, she'd done well, grown a bit through the summer and I'd been very pleased with her on the way to, up to Chepstow. We stepped her up to two and a half and she was, she was impressive. Um, she was getting a little bit difficult to place because she had a double penalty. She didn't have a handicap mark. And so I thought we would look at Newbury, but I thought taking on Dan's filly, giving it eight, we were nearly impossible task, but she surprised me, um, did it well. Um, and she'll go back to Newbury on Ladbroke Day for the listed mares. Given her profile and, and what she's achieved, you would say placing her going forward in, in those listed mares races would surely be the plan. Well, I think it will be, you know, we have to up the, up the stand a little bit now with her and I do think she she will be better at two and a half you know a good staying pedigree there and you know I, I was Charles bought her um, sort of off his own back at the sales and I remember saying to him are you sure I mean she was tiny <laughs> at the sales but he absolutely loved the way she strutted around the parade ring and um, he, he was very much right. Alan I'm going to give you one race that you haven't won yet that you can win what's it going to be? Gold Cup. <laughs> Whether it's one. Asking or Chelsea, I don't mind actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've just I, I've never been a huge fan of the Grand National, and I would I would much rather if I could get a Gold Cup horse. But my goodness, they're hard to find. But that we you know we've been placed. But how can Generali was fourth in it a few years ago, and um, that's the ultimate as far as I'm concerned. So that's it for the latest edition of this racing life. Thank you to you for watching, and we'll see you again very soon. <laughs>